My name is Dan Finucan, and I'm currently a regent. I love folk music, blues music, and I love singing and playing with other people. My name is Ian Peoples. I'm a Jesuit regent. I'm kind of a football fanatic. Most of my weekends are spent watching at least a few games. Um, I'm probably one of the biggest Lino Messi fans. Hello and welcome back to Maja's Talk. I'm your host, Ian Peoples, and I'm joined by my brother Jesuit and co-host, Dan Finucan. This month marks the 60th anniversary of the first session held for the Second Vatican Council, commonly referred to as Vatican II. It's no exaggeration to say that Vatican II was the most transformative and significant event in the Catholic Church in the 20th century and remains essential for how the Church lives out its mission and identity in the 21st century. To mark this anniversary, we are going to take this episode to talk about the Council, what it was, what led up to it, and what its significance has been in the last 60 years of the Church's life. We will offer some history and also discuss some common questions that people have had about the Council. Our first question is maybe the most obvious one. What was Vatican II? Vatican II was a worldwide gathering that was called for by Pope St. John XXIII in January 1959 and convened for four sessions from 1962 to 1965. Nearly 2,400 bishops, cardinals, and religious superiors, known as Council Fathers, participated, along with hundreds of theological advisors, known as Periti? Is that how you pronounce that, Dan? That's right. Periti. The singular would be Peritus. Periti, or Peritus. Over the course of four years, the Council introduced, discussed, and debated dozens of topics essential to the life of the Catholic Church, ultimately producing 16 documents. The name Vatican II refers, first of all, to the place where the Council occurred, Vatican City. And it was the second Council to take place there, following Vatican I, which took place from 1869 to 1870. Vatican II is only the 21st ecumenical or worldwide council to have taken place in the Catholic Church, meaning it's a rare and incredibly important event. Dan, what led to Vatican II? Great question. So Pope St. John XXIII, who was elected in 1958 at the age of 76, was thought to be a transitional figure due to his age, um, but also was known as a jovial spirit. In January 1959, he announced his intention to call a church-wide council, which shocked the church and the world. This shock can be attributed not just to Pope John's age, but also to the climate of the church at the time. There did not seem to be a need for a council because, after all, previous councils were usually held in response to crises in the church. They would debate vexing doctrinal questions or confront corruption in the church or condemn heresies that were deemed damaging to the church. And no such crisis confronted the church in 1959. Leading up to the council, the average Catholic experienced the church as timeless and permanent. When people went to mass, it was celebrated in Latin with the priest facing away from the congregation in a liturgy that had been largely the same since the 16th century. The church was a steady presence in people's lives, and often families' weeks revolved around activities at the parish. Additionally, the church served as an unchanging anchor in a modern world that had been gripped by two devastating world wars during the first half of the 20th century. The church sought to shield people from modern questions coming from science, reason, and the growing appeal of atheism in the West, reinforcing the centrality of the Christian worldview and defending that worldview from the modern world. As a result, there was a presumption for the average Catholic that the church would continue in this direction indefinitely. For many, there was no need for the church to change or reform. There are two key dynamics that guided this reform at the council. Resourcement and aggiornamento. Let's talk about those. Well, well pronounced. Thank you. That's right. Underneath the appearance of timelessness and permanence in the church, reform was actually underway. Two dynamics played a role in this reform as well as in the council in the 1960s. Several theologians in Europe, especially in France, were going back to the sources, an important movement known as ressourcement, or in English, 
a return to the sources. This meant returning to early theological thinkers and writings from the first several centuries of the church. The reason for this is that most theology by the 1930s and 1940s was pretty stale. Theology was largely taught through reading manuals full of statements about God, Christ, faith, morals, and the church. It was kind of in propositional form. Hmm. And there was little room for grappling with questions, especially questions that the modern world was putting out there. Plus, almost everyone who studied theology was a seminarian or a priest, a seminarian in route to becoming a priest or somebody who was already ordained. Almost no lay people studied theology before the council. So by going back to writings from the first millennium of the church, theologians found freshness and renewal in those writings, which helped invigorate movements towards reforming the liturgy, which began in the 1930s, understanding the church as a dynamic pilgrim people, and appreciating how doctrine develops over time within the life of the church. Additionally, significant developments in scripture studies were well underway by the late 1950s. Most notably, scholars were beginning to learn from anthropology, history, and archaeology about the ancient cultures and contexts that scripture stories were written in, helping them understand the context for stories in the Bible, which leads to a second important movement, aggiornamento. Again, pretty good pronunciation. Well done. That's perfect. Thank you. So aggiornamento literally means bringing up to date. Though the church appeared timeless and permanent in the experience of the average Catholic, theologians and some church leaders saw the need for the church to read the signs of the times and respond in order to be faithful to the richness of the gospel. These two key movements, Ressourcement and Aggiornamento, work together at the council. Returning to the sources was not a return to some idealized past or running from the urgent and often perplexing questions of the modern world. Rather, the Council Fathers and their theologians were attempting to address modern questions and issues faced by the church by drawing upon the theological richness and wisdom of the past, as well as modern developments in theology, philosophy, and pastoral experience. As a result, the Council was an experience of a new Pentecost, to use the words of John the 23rd, of opening the doors and windows for the Holy Spirit to blow new life into the church. Another question, who was at Vatican II and what happened? From October 1962 until December 1965, bishops gathered at four plenary sessions at the Vatican. As we mentioned earlier, there were nearly 2,500 participants in the council's proceedings. Among attendees were Carl Wotiwa, Archbishop of Krakow, Pope St. John Paul II, and Father Joseph Ratzinger, a theological advisor, Pope Benedict XVI, as well as other influential theologians such as Karl Rahner, S.J., Yves Congar from the Dominicans, and American John Courtney Murray, a Jesuit. Bishops from all of the continents of the world participated, representing corners of the world that had never or rarely participated in a council before. The council demonstrated that the church was a deepening identity as a truly universal global church in its embrace of more and more of the world's peoples. In a famous essay after the council, theologian Karl Rahner said that the council marked a shift from the Catholic church being a European export to a truly world church, noting the diversity of the church seen at the council. In addition to bishops and major superiors of men's religious orders, representatives of Protestant churches and Eastern Orthodox churches attended as non-voting observers. Nearly two dozen women also served as lay auditors at the, at the council, though they were also non-voting members, and their numbers were minuscule, of course, compared to the male participation. It was a small yet important step toward inclusion of women in the church's leadership. So how did the council actually function? What were they talking about and how did they move from conversations to debate and finally to writing down things and documents? Prior to the council, bishops submitted ideas and topics for discussion that were crafted into schemata or drafts for the council fathers and the theological advisors to discuss in smaller working sessions and then debate in plenary sessions. Finally, bishops would vote on any amendments and then eventually to approve the documents. After the bishops voted to approve, the Pope would finally approve and then promulgate the documents as the official teaching of the council and the church. 
Although debates and voting could be quite contentious at times, all documents were approved with significant majorities of bishops in support. So what documents did Vatican II produce? What did the Council teach and how did it teach? In all, Vatican II produced 16 documents over four sessions. In these 16 documents, the Council taught about what the Church is from, I would say, three different perspectives or directions. The first is that the Church reflected on itself. What does it mean to be Church? Prior to the Council, the Church's self-understanding had become kind of juridical and hierarchical. Many spoke about the Church's structures and the powers of the members of the hierarchy, but didn't consider so much the role of the laity. And this isn't to discredit or devalue the spiritual lives of countless laity and clergy. Rather, priestly ordination was often given significantly more attention and even more importance than baptism and the role of the laity within the Church. This was seen most significantly in the liturgy. As we mentioned before, the priest was the one who celebrated the Mass, did so in Latin, and the faithful were pretty passive observers of the priest's actions. This was the same no matter where one was in the world, whether in Europe, or Latin America, or Africa. Rooted in a return to scripture and other ideas about the church from its early tradition, the constitutions on the liturgy and the church sought to deepen the church's understanding of itself beyond merely a hierarchy or a juridical understanding. The council taught that at the heart of the church is the mystery of the triune God, who seeks communion with humanity through the mission of the church in the world. The council spoke about the church as the body of Christ and people of God, helping capture the primary importance of baptism, that each person through baptism is invited to participate fully and actively in the communal life of the church as priest, prophet, and king. Ordination for priests and consecration for bishops signified a specific and important role of service within a community of many gifts and talents. This shift is best exemplified in the council's renewal of a theology of the local church. At its center, the bishop and his priests is the shepherd at the service of his flock, the local church. Think the Diocese of Belize City, Belmopan. The central action of the local church is the celebration of the Eucharist. The faithful are to be active participants in the liturgy alongside their bishops and priests. By making provisions for the use of each local church's local language, rather than a uniform use of Latin, and for the adaptation of some liturgical elements to the culture of the local church, the council helped the universal church, as a communion of all of these local churches, become more enfleshed in the diverse cu cultures of each local church. The decree on the church's missionary activity used the beautiful imagery of the gospel being planted like a seed. When planted, it takes on the nutrients of the soil, which is the culture of the local church. And the entire communion of local churches, the universal church, becomes richer in its diversity while remaining unified in the one Christ. Rather than solely emphasizing structure and hierarchy, the Council saw the role of structure and hierarchy within the larger view of the Church as a diverse community of those called to holiness through a participation in the life of the Triune God. Independent documents on the laity, religious life, ordained priesthood, and bishops each attempted to draw out the implications of this richer view of the Church. The second main direction that the Council went in was to reflect on the relationship of the Church to other Christians and non-Christians. The early 20th century saw the initial steps of what would become the ecumenical movement. The Catholic Church's stance on ecumenism prior to the Council could be termed as a kind of ecumenism of return. Those who were Christian but remained outside the Catholic Church needed to return to the true Church of Christ, the Catholic Church. The stance against non-Christians tended to be harsher. However, at the Council, two key things occurred. First, in both the Constitution on the Church and the Decree on Ecumenism, the Council recognized that essential elements of the One Church of Christ do exist outside of the Catholic Church in other Christian communities. Furthermore, in an unprecedented statement, the Council admitted that the rifts between Catholics and non-Catholic Christians were the fault of all involved, not just the other churches, but also some fault stood with the Catholic Church as well.
but they acknowledged that a certain, though imperfect, communion among them existed. And then in the Council's decree on non-Christian religions, the Council proclaimed that the Church rejects nothing which is true or holy in other religions, opening an era of interreligious dialogue to discern the depth of this statement following the Council. Finally, the Council spoke to the Church's relationship with the modern world. As we mentioned earlier, a deep-rooted distrust in the modern world and its ideas and institutions prevailed within the Church prior to the Council. Any implementation of these ideas in theology or the life of the Church was subjected to strict discipline or even silencing. Ironically, many of the most prominent theologians at Vatican II, Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar, John Curtin Murray, and Karl Rahner, were silenced in the years leading up to the Council for examining some of these new ideas. Two of the most heavily debated documents of the Council, the Declaration on Religious Liberty and the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, dealt head-on with the Church's relationship with the modern world. In the Declaration, the Church recognized the right rooted in the human person's dignity to religious freedom and stated that it is the duty of the state to recognize and protect this right for its citizens. In the Constitution of the Church in the Modern World, called Gaudium et Spes, the Council clearly stated that the Church must read the signs of the times and have the courage to be in dialogue and contact with the modern world. Its opening line is perhaps the most famous of the Council. It stressed the solidarity of the Church with humanity. It says, The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these too are the joys and hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the followers of Christ. Something else that is important to point out is that the documents of Vatican II were very different than documents from previous councils. Jesuit historian John O'Malley notes in his excellent history of the council, what happened at Vatican II, that Vatican II not only wrote on important topics, but spoke in a way that no other previous council ever had. Previous councils often produced canons or rules for the church's life as well as condemnations, either of specific people as heretics or heresies or movements deemed dangerous to the church and its doctrine. Vatican II documents were written in a different style, one that aimed to inspire and draw the church into deeper reflection and wonder at the mystery of the church and its relationship to God and the world. Lumen Gentium, for example, began not by reiterating, reiterating the hierarchical structure of the church, but by locating the church in relation to its source and goal in the holy mystery of our triune God. And then it goes on to give numerous images from scripture for the church, images that penetrate not only the head, but the heart. As such, there were no lists of canons issued, nor was there a single condemnation issued by the council. So maybe you're wondering, how can I at home, read some of the documents of Vatican II. Where can I find them? We hope you are wondering that because you can go to the Vatican website and all of the documents are there for free for you to either look at or you can even download them or print them out. Uh, and so we'll include links to that in our show notes. Uh, Dan, where can someone learn more about Vatican II? Well, Frankly, there are many, many books about Vatican II, about its history, the content of its teaching, its significance back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, up through now, and speculation about the future. Um, so here are a few resources for further study. We mentioned already John O'Malley's book, which is really great, What Happened at Vatican II. It's an excellent history of the council. But if you're wanting something a little shorter, there's a short 150-page history of the council by Giuseppe Alberigo, another Italian name for you. Giuseppe Alberigo. And that book is simply entitled A Brief History of Vatican II. It will come as no surprise to you, probably, that there are a lot of different interpretations of the council and its significance. And so a couple of good but different takes on the teachings of Vatican II include The Keys to the Council, Unlocking the Teaching of Vatican II by Richard Gallardi and Catherine Clifford, and a second book, Vatican II, Renewal Within Tradition, edited by Matthew Lamb and Matthew Blevering. We'll include those in the uh, show notes as well. 
So we've been discussing the council in this episode, what led up to it, and a little bit about the documents, what happened at the council. But let's talk a little bit about the legacy of Vatican II from our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as young people who were not alive for the council and were not even born until well after the council had occurred. Um, so maybe, Ian, tell us a little bit about what, what do you think is important about the council for today? Yeah, one of my close Jesuit friends and mentors is a guy named Father John Payne, whom I've talked about on the show before. But Father John entered the Jesuits in 1957, and he tells me of the swooping changes that took place in the church in that time. Now, one of the more important shifts that occurred at Vatican II was the idea that this idea that holiness was not limited to priests and religious, that it was attainable in other vocations, that there was this universal call to holiness that Vatican II gave to the people of God. And so there were, from what Father John told me and what I've heard from others, that there was this immediate sort of upheaval and even we could call it an exodus in priestly and religious vocations. And that really uh, shook John up, right, when he talks about this, because it was a time of just sweeping change and these people that he loved and that he was working alongside of as, as priests, right, or even as sisters, um, you know, that they they were leaving religious life. And, and uh, I think that made him look at his own vocation, too. Um, and so that was a challenging time for him, but he really talks about himself as uh, a man who loves Vatican II, um, that even though there was this challenging time, that he recognized the the necessary grace that this idea of the universal call to holiness that that had for the world. And so that was, uh, I think this universal call to holiness is, is such a profound um, idea. Uh, and if you read the documents, it really talks about lay people transforming the world in their given profession or vocations, whether that's in business or in government or wherever it is, right? Um, and so that's, that's a great idea for us to, to take out, especially as Jesuits, we talk about finding God in all things. And I think that's perfectly in line with this spirit of Vatican II. Um, and I think the other issue that I, is really important from Vatican II, it, which you already kind of mentioned, is how we speak about and relate with other religions. Um, you know, in Nostra Aetate, the declaration of the relationship of the church to non-Christian religions, it says that the Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these non-Christian religions. Like Christians, while witnessing to their own faith and way of life, acknowledge, preserve, and encourage the spiritual and moral truths found among non-Christians, together with their social life and culture. So it's hard to stress how important this is, uh, this message is, um, was and is today, especially when we have such a global consciousness and we grapple with and confront religious plurality, you know, everywhere we go. And so this simple declaration is, is a call to look to other religions in, and their adherents with a discerning love and respect and a sense of humility in recognizing the like it says, the spiritual and moral truths present in those. And so I think that's a really profound shift for us to think about as, as Christians. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an invitation to uh, humility. It's an invitation to seeking to encounter somebody first, to learn right to, what do they believe, rather than sort of immediately trying to you know, force feed them Christianity, right? That, really Jesus calls us to be in relationship. And I think this document is a reminder of that. Um, so Dan, what about for you? What, what impact do you think Vatican II has had in, in your own thinking or, uh, you know, especially maybe with your dad, who's a theologian himself. And so yeah, you probably had more conversations about this than I did. Right? Well, a lot of people <laughs> think that we sat around the dinner table just Yucking it up about <laughs> theology. My dad's a theology professor, but, but honestly, we were, we were pretty, uh, we had a normal table conversation. <laughs> um, but no, I think regarding this question, there's a, there's a lot that, that can be said. And I think, you know, now that we're 60 years beyond the council, um, and there's less and less people who, who know the church before the council. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, it's hard to, to grasp, or it's harder to grasp just how monumental. Uh, I'm an event. Mm -hmm. This was, and, and you know, when I do talk to my dad um, about what mass was like before the council, um, you know, he talks about being a kid serving at mass 
And you know, no one in the, in the congregation knew Latin, so all the responses were were done by the server. It's a lot of pressure. And a lot of learning. You had to memorize all this mm-hmm. stuff. And it was more than what we have now, even in English. And so um, it was the server's job then to do that work mm-hmm. and be the active participant. Um, and, you know, I think that that is maybe a small example. But, you know, most people weren't paying much attention. The bells that were rung were actually to remind people, okay, this is a big deal now. This <laughs> Mass is happening. <laughs> consecration is, is happening. Yeah. Um, and it was just different, you know, I think, uh, now we see such an explosion in, in lay leadership and ministry, Mm -hmm. as you were talking about in the church. Um, and, you know, I think that that thinking about how much liturgical music has changed, how much it's expanded, um, how much being able to pray in one's native language matters, um, the language that you pray in on your own is the language you pray in in community and, and mm-hmm. how, um, how impactful that is, I think, is, is really important. Um, you know, I think to, to, talk, to kind of bring it back to what you were saying about, about John, um, there's, there's a, a narrative out there about decline. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, part of that narrative is, is maybe is true and warranted, but I think sometimes people talk about the decline in vocations, um, when they talk about the aftermath of Vatican II. And I think when we think about vocations, we often mean religious yeah. vocations and I'm sure it was really shocking at the time. But I think maybe looking back, um, we can see, yeah, there's something to grieve there, but what's, what's new? what's being born here and how might um, the call that people are receiving or the calls they're receiving might be, maybe God is actually just as God uh, and God's spirit was active in the council. Maybe God is calling us in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that, 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 um, that that's, that can be a really powerful way of looking at it, that lay people are, are maybe being called into a larger role in the church I think about, you know, for, for us as Jesuits, there's fewer Jesuits. There's, there's no debate about that. Um, and yet there's an opportunity um, for lay people to join in on our mission. Mm-hmm. Um, and for it to not just be something that, that we own and that we let them participate in, mm-hmm. but that they are full and active um, parts in that as well. Um, and, you know, the final thing I would say is, is simply that I think the Synod on Synodality really does capture what Vatican II is trying to do. Mm-hmm. They're really exploring what does it mean to be church? And it's not something we just talk about once in a while, but that together we talk about it in an mm-hmm. ongoing way, um, how we do church. Which leads to one of our final questions, maybe our penultimate question. Mm-hmm. Will there be a Vatican III? <laughs> <laughs> Not until we actually implement Vatican II. <laughs> another way to phrase this question is, will there be another council? And the answer is yes, eventually. Um, you know, over the course of time and circumstances and the call of the Holy Spirit, um, which, you know, will also determine, be determined by who the Pope is. So all that will determine if there's another council. Uh, but more importantly, the church is, is still beginning to implement Vatican II. Um, even today. It's said that it takes a few decades. I've heard one priest say 50 years. Yeah. This is John Payne. He said 50 years. So we're kind of seeing it now um, to implement a council, the teachings of this, into the life of the church. And so as a result, it's our, our job to learn about the council, to read what it taught, and to continue to reflect as a church community, whatever our role is, on how to be church in the world. And so yeah, who knows when the next council will be. It'll happen. It will happen. Uh, probably in our lifetime. Maybe. I mean, depending on how long we live. We're not guaranteed another day. True. This is all true. True. Just a reminder to go to confession for everyone. <laughs> that brings us to our final question. There it is, our ultimate question. <laughs> the last questions. No, our final question is, what is your favorite document of Vatican II? Or favorite teaching of Vatican II? or results of Vatican II. So I'm going to throw that over to you, Dan. A teaching from the document on the liturgy Mm -hmm. uh, that I love and I think uh, often gets overlooked 
Mm. It's one of my favorite parts of what the council taught that Christ is present in four ways at the, at the mass, at the liturgy. Um, yes, in, in, in the way that we would most expect, right? So in the elements themselves, in the bread and the wine, mm-hmm. transform mm-hmm. the body and blood of Christ. Number two, in the priest, serving as the head of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Three, in the people gathered, singing and praying together, the, the okay. body. And then in the word of God. So when we have the liturgy, the word that Christ is present there. And there's no like hierarchy between those four. It never says one of these, Christ is more present than the other. And I think that if we get lost in is one more than the other, I think we lose a, a sense in which this sacrament, this liturgy is really drawing us into hmm. being the fullness of Christ's body hmm. through the, the word, which forms us in the story of the gospels of salvation history, mm-hmm. but also by partaking in this meal. And we're led by the presider, the priest who's leading all of us as a congregation and that we're being formed into this body mm-hmm. to go out into the world. I just think that that's powerful. I think it's, it, if we really took that seriously, if we really sat mm-hmm. with that and meditated on it, um, I think that that would really be fascinating for, for the church to, to live that out in mm-hmm. a full way. Mm-hmm. And yourself, what would you say? It has to be the universal call to holiness. I mean, because even though I'm pursuing a religious vocation, I am pursuing a priestly vocation. So, you know, that's... Uh, um, obviously one one pursuit, one pathway to living a life close to God, but just to open up in people's minds but with an official teaching of the church, a document that says you can be a carpenter, which is the documents often refer to about Jesus sort of working um, a daily a, a day job, right? That Jesus had a day job. That um, that you can be a carpenter. That you can be uh, a doctor of medicine. That you can be a daycare, you know, personnel. That holiness is to be found and enacted in every part of your life. That actually you're as a Christian person, right? As a baptized Christian, as a member of the body of Christ, you're meant to go out and be Christ to the world, right? No matter where you're at, what you're doing. And I think that's just such a, if we actually live that out, every Christian person, I mean, if I actually live that out on a daily basis in my own life, but if if we all did, this world would be a vastly different place. There are one point, there are one and a half almost billion Catholics, not to mention the hundreds of millions of Christians in the world, right? So if all of us were living that out, it would be, a transformed world, and so I think that's just such a great, uh, a great reminder uh, of who we are in the world. Right, that the church, the body of Christ, is a sacrament to the world, God's presence in the world. So, uh, yeah, the universal call to holiness. Great, mm-hmm. and we hope that you think about that question too, and think about your own experience in the Catholic Church these last sixty years, and if you're old enough to remember to think about how the church has changed over over these decades. As always, thanks for being with us. We do appreciate your viewership, your listenership. And if you have any comments, questions, thoughts, ideas for shows that you'd like to send to us, please do so on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, If you're listening on Guadalupe Media Radio, it's great to, to have you with us. And if you're watching from home on your TV, great to see you. And we'll see you next time. Happy 60th anniversary, Vatican II.